Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Gavs Williams Show. And I am absolutely just um, <laughs> incredibly excited. What a brilliant guest I have got for you today. A legend, absolute major legend of electronic music. I'd say dance music, but it's much more than dance music. I think it's a legend of electronic music. Um, Mr. Paul Hartnell from the legendary band. And it is legendary. I'm using these big terms, but it is true of Orbital. And uh, Orbital, gosh, 30 years since their first uh, chart hit in with um, Chime, incredible tune, which I have got. I can't find it. I was having a little look. Uh, I've got, um, well, I've got Midnight. I think this is from 91. Um, Orbital have just been an incredibly influential act, not just on myself, but on the whole of <laughs> the whole of music is so it's so broad um they were one of the first bands who, who emerged from the dance scene who just really understood melody and understood um musical qualities which perhaps were missing from a lot of the kind of early rave stuff um and uh yeah i mean wow what a what a transformatory time that was and for things to have lasting value orbital made music of lasting value anyway without further ado let me bring in my guest mr paul hartnell hello there sir hello hello how you doing i can go i can go go to sleep soundly now after that intro tonight that's great thank you no my, you know my pleasure it's a major thrill i mean wow so much to talk about, really. So, um, so f firstly, though, Orbital have been back, back in proper business. It had a few years away, um, but uh, new album was it last year? Woo! <laughs> I, I think it was the end of the year before, actually. Eighteen. Okay. Yeah, October eighteen. And that was the first one. So that was the first one for a few years. I haven't done enough research. Yeah, about yet. five years. <laughs> five years. Uh, gap between between now i mean i did a um I, you know i did i did a solo album in between as well i haven't kind of stopped um when was that i think that was maybe six 2016 15 that i did a solo album mm. um 858 so you know i've been been constantly working and um did a season of peaky blinders and some other sort of tv and film work as well in between wow <laughs> um but that's an interesting question there though how different was working on your own to working i mean we should say really when you work as orbital it's just you and your brother phil isn't it there's never been any other members as such no no we i mean we've kind of worked with engineers producers along the way as well i you know yeah if you're talking on those terms i have to give a shout out to mickey mann who was our sound engineer but so much more than that you know for live and then he well the first year that we went out with him was um 92 on a the communion tour with meat beat manifesto supporting oh, cool. them in america and that was where we we'd known him before that because he used to be the sound engineer for the shaman and they were the first band to tuck us under their wing and use us as a support band which was brit they taught us a lot yeah and then we went on tour with meat beat manifesto got to know mickey really well for the first for this month and then when we came back he came into the studio to sort of engineer and help out with the brown album and he kind of lends a lot of creativity as well. I guess, you know, I, I'd only ever been a bedroom producer. Um, you know, I, I'd only ever done an album in my parents' sitting room and sort of half <laughs> under the stairs back in Dunton Green in Seven Oaks. <laughs> and so I didn't really know the roles of producers and engineers and all of that kind of thing. So Mickey just came in to engineer. But now when I look back at it, he was kind of co-producing it with us and coming up with all sorts of you know, crazy psychedelic ideas as well. It was great. Mm. So he was, you know, he was important on a few different albums. So uh, that's so interesting then. So um, so coming back to that working method then, I mean, um, having worked with your brother on so many, well, seminal releases, but also that, that kind of um, back and forth and however that decision-making process worked, working on your own, what, what did you notice was most different between that, those different processes? I think like well, I, I'm the writer of, of Orbital anyway, so I, it's the difference isn't that great in lots of ways. Although, if I'm writing for Orbital, then I, my brother is a sounding board. Do you know what I mean? So he might be sat in the room saying, "Oh, I don't like that. Oh, I don't like that. You know, why don't you do it like that? Or do it more like this? Or that bit's good, 
Now, that can get you there quicker. If you've got someone else in the room as a sounding board, I find, you know, it can be frustrating at times if you disagree, but then sometimes it pushes you in a different direction. And sometimes it, so what it's really helpful for is if you do something that's quite good and that person is in harmony with you and says, oh, yeah, that's good, you don't question it. Whereas what you've got to learn to do if you're on, on your own yeah. is not question stuff, which, I, you know, I've, right. got, I've got quite good at that. Um, because as soon as the internal Greek chorus comes in here, <laughs> go and make a cup of tea, forget about it, come back to it, and you'll hear it as you heard it when before you questioned it. You know, yeah. I think that's a lot of the, the the problems that that people have is they just try and second guess what other people will think of it. What you know, and I just don't think it's it's, it's just not worth doing that. You just got to get on with it and and please yourself and just finish something and then decide whether you like it or not at the end you know yes so ju judging things too early is it, it can really sort of kill that process and yeah, absolutely yeah mm. as soon as you judge yeah. you're out of the now when you're creating you're in the moment when you when you start judging you're now you're now projecting into the future we just need uh, to... and the past you know <laughs> just need to write a big highlighter pen over that last sentence there just so everyone so it really sticks out that yeah, yeah. is fabulous fabulous information uh, fabulous uh, um advice yes so because many i wish i could take it myself sometimes <laughs> yes because <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm sure that's something that like loads of us go through as well um yeah and i think as well especially with the more esoteric side of like electronic music it's so abstract in terms of whether something is it goes outside of it being a clearly definable if it's good or bad it's because it's so weird <laughs> and when you're in a realm of utter weirdness there is a weird saying that though within weirdness there's definitely good and bad isn't there how would, how would well, you... i don't know i i would disagree on a certain level because if the artist liked what they did and they're the only person who likes it, does that make it bad? Do you know what I mean? It's still good if that artist was happy and, and creative and enjoyed it. Um, you know, but do other people want to listen to it? Not necessarily. That's like saying if a six-year-old <laughs> draws a picture of a horse <laughs> that had a great time, you're not going to hang it in the National Gallery. <laughs> However, it yeah. doesn't mean they didn't enjoy it and it wasn't, you know, a, a valid vali piece of a art. valid, yes. Amazing. I get the highlighter pen back out on that one as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's loads of electronic music I don't like. In fact, there's most of it I don't like. I'm very, very, very picky with my electronic music. But that's inevitable because I've spent 30 years, you know, in a cube looking at a computer screen or a sequencer making the stuff. And so when I have my own leisure time, it's, it's, it's got to really pique my interest. It's got to do something that I think, oh, I didn't think of that or or that's right. interesting or yeah. I've got to stop listening to it and hearing how it's made and just relax into it because like... I tend to kind of listen to music a bit like one of those car manuals where they explode the engine and, and name all the bits and then put it back together again. I kind of listen to music and mentally pull it apart and put it back and that's okay as well. But, you know, it's I am I am very picky with electronic music, but if I hear some good stuff, it's great. So come on then, spill the beans. What have you heard recently? <laughs> um can i swear uh, yeah. no, no, no um f all really i haven't heard much that i've enjoyed recently okay um i'm trying to think let me see and that doesn't mean there isn't good stuff you see this is back to that mm. subjective thing i'm yeah. not saying there's not good stuff out there yeah um i haven't heard stuff that's got to me i, th I have been listening a little bit to uh, um, the Aphex Twin Ciro album, which obviously is, is old now, but uh, older. Um, but I do still enjoy Richard's stuff. I, mm. He always sort of tweaks my interest in a funny kind of... It's a funny kind of way. So I don't know if it's like the maths part of my brain mostly gets tweaked by him, but he does have a kind of sense of melancholy melody over the top of that that just gives it that human element to something which is quite dystopian and stark sometimes oh absolutely yeah wow no brilliant i mean and somebody who's had a similar length journey as well in terms of uh their career i guess um yeah yeah you know and um is it i yeah i do wonder about this as well about uh the electronic acts who have um 
stayed the course. And it's really, it is quite interesting thinking about the ones because they were the ones, I feel anyway, who were always the the best ones have survived. And um, and with that, I'm talking you know, Underworld, I think, an incredible act. And I've uh, had my association with Underworld. And um, I know you're friends with Carl. Um, they've had a long, long career. And um, also uh, the Chems as well, Chemical Brothers. It's, just, it's interesting because I feel that the quality and absolutely with, with uh, Orbital... There was something there at the beginning. It wasn't like these. They, do you know what I mean? There's, some, there's something you just kind of get it. It's there from the start, and it carries through. Apex. It's oh, maybe it's just because. Oh, of great I've artists. just thought something. Yeah. I know there is there is an album I've been listening to recently, and I, I it, yeah, it just slipped off my radar for the last week. But um, that's the new Nathan Fake album. Oh. I think he's done a really good album oh. now at the at the moment. It's 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 a really it's it's got a kind of it's very kind of electronic. It's very stark, but yet it's kind of warm and cuddly as well. He's it, managed to sort <laughs> of get that get that balance between kind of warmth and distortion and sort of beauty and starkness really really nicely. It's quite it feels quite natural. It's the best way of describing it. It's got. Mm. A, yeah, when he hits the, the 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 sort of the ball, as it were, with that kind of thing, he really gets it right. I think it's, mm. it's a yeah, it's a really nice. Um, that's a that's a lovely album. I've been listening to Amon Tobin's one. I think it's from a couple of years ago. One he made primarily with an um, uh, an Omnicord, um, and uh, okay, that that one is oh, I think is really really cool. Again, he's one of those great acts who's been around for well, not as long as you guys, but a seeming long time. But uh, this idea of longevity, though, this is something that I kind of wanted to talk about a little bit because because um, you've put out so many. Re- How many albums now? Orbital albums? Uh, oh no, I don't know. Um, <laughs> hang on, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Is it only eight? Eight. I think it's eight actual orbital albums um there's probably someone at home screaming now going you <laughs> idiot you've forgotten that. but there's um, yeah. been at least two two score albums and i've had two solo albums as well mm. so <clears throat> to keep finding inspiration then and um i was curious about if you know you're going to be going out on the road with orbital does that affect the writing process do you think about do you think about it from uh, how it's going to go over to a large crowd who maybe really want to dance and or whatnot, or or how, well, how do you how do you? Well, I think yeah, it's a funny one because I've done that once before the Wonky album. Um, I kind of I sat there and just thought, okay, let's let's just write an album that's going to be good to, to play live, mm-hmm. um, and so kept that firmly in mind, which was quite good it was it was yeah it i find kind of the best it's going to sound weird it's almost counterproductive but creative bondage is a way of getting really creative so if you say write an album about anything you like people tend to flounder and don't really know what to do if you say write an album with these three synths in four days that's really good to play live and you can only do it in the key of C, <laughs> then they're going to come up with something much more creative because they, they, they instantly right. you've narrowed people's horizons down, yeah. um, which is why I love film scoring so much because mm. it's such, it's like someone says, be as creative as you like, as you like through this tiny square here. Do you know what I mean? And you've <laughs> got to fit it in around the dialogue, the action, the time. There's, there's no sense of bar count or anything like that. The pace changes and, you know, it's kind of, it's so much fun. It's brilliant. I love it. I guess that's uh, being released then from that uh, expectation to maybe, well, I mean, I was talking about that with uh, an audience who maybe expects a dance, uh, a, a, you know, expect to dance to a gig. I remember back in 93 uh, when the Orb played in Glastonbury on the, the other stage or the enemy stage, I think it was called. Back I was there. Yeah. <laughs> it was a oh, it was a, oh, they didn't drop they didn't drop the beat at all they teased no. the entire gig and the the four on the floor the the big drop into the beat 
never happened. And it was well, it did. But we did get little fluffy clouds right near the end, and the whole place erupted, and it was brilliant. But more, we yeah. wanted more. I know, it was, but that's the thing. That's yeah. the year before we played there. So when yeah. we came the next year, people were really gagging for it <laughs> for a bit of house. You know? <laughs> oh, it's brilliant. So Glastonbury Festival, now I know that a lot of you will know what that is, but I know that some of you maybe on the other side of the pond uh, are not so familiar with it. Glastonbury Festival is um, it's an astonishing, enormous music festival. I think it, is it the world's biggest one? I think it certainly yeah, is. Yeah, it's like Coachella, but really good. <laughs> <laughs> I could, look, you know, I have been to both, so I think I'm qualified to say that. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but um yeah but glastonbury is and slightly better than ross gilder <laughs> oh yeah that's a classic i've never done i've never played that one actually that is a that's still that's good mm. it's good it's good it's, it's <laughs> not quite up there with glastonbury for kind of total psychedelic madness but oh, yeah. it's um it's pretty good well i was going to say that about glastonbury though they the, the sort of underground culture in britain the county culture something that actually Britain is is one of Britain's greatest assets, in my opinion. The, the 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 art and creativity and amazing things that come out of the underground counterculture is just staggering. And you, you know, and there's no better place than Glastonbury to kind of appreciate just how vast and how powerful that that actually is. And I, I think that's what I wanted to say about Glastonbury, though. Glastonbury is. It, it is a cultural, it's a very important cultural event for this underground culture that's somehow not recognised as as being, um, I guess that's the nature of an underground culture though, isn't it? Uh, now, Glastonbury should have happened this last weekend uh, and it would have been yeah. quite a nice one. Well, no, what was the weather like? I can't remember. Um, it was It was raining here. To get, so it was it, raining. It's definitely Glastonbury weekend. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Because it... A Glastonbury, a Glastonbury experience can be very, very different depending on the weather. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> so actually, '94 that's a glory, glorious year, I think, weather-wise, wasn't it? it? Was. Beautiful. So, yeah, beautiful. And uh, that was headline slot, was it on the other stage or was it enemy stage? That's right. Yeah, yeah. enemy stage. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, um, I was there. I was there. I was there. I was there. I saw that gig. I can't remember an awful lot about it <laughs> i know i was definitely there um gosh wow glastonbury that that must have been a real thrill then uh to 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 really you've definitely arrived haven't you when you've uh when you've oh, it, was headline brilliant. Glastonbury. it was brilliant because uh bjork was kind of headlining that stage really um she you know she was mega sort of indie pop princess you know she at the was, time yeah and um um, our management asked, uh, or agent asked her, you know, oh, do you mind, could we swap places and let let the boys go on afterwards because it's all about the light show? And she went, yeah, sure, no, bo- no problem. Because she likes to sing early. She she likes, you know, it's better for her voice. But I, I asked her a couple of years ago, I bumped into her for the first time and said, did you really let us play? Was that, did you do that? She said, oh, I can't remember, probably, because I love to, I'm, a, I, I'm an early girl. I like to go on early. So, you know, yeah, bound to. But um, you know, it was amazing. it was amazing. It's like the, <laughs> mm. the you know, Glastonbury hadn't had any big dance music up to that point. Like you say, it had the Orb the year before, which was brilliant. The Shaman the year before that, but nobody doing sort of full on constant sort of nine oh nine three oh three, you know, acid house. And by that point, we also had some sort of jungle stroke sort of drum and bass influence as well with with some of the tracks and. It was it was the first time we'd been sampling Goldfrapp as well before she was when she was just Alison before she was Goldfrapp wow. as it were, and um, it's yeah it was it was it was just brilliant you know because people were just ready for it and the the lineup was fantastic that day because you had um, Dub Syndicate at some point oh, then you had um, M People Bjork orbital so it just kind of built up into this kind of frenzy of of acid house and yeah. and sort of big big riff. You know what, what I think of as, for want of a better word, not that I've ever played a stadium, but sort of stadium kind of house riffs. A bit, so it's a bit like punk rock or something. You know, big, strong, powerful riffs that if you don't know the band, you still get get it. You right. hear it and go, "Oh yeah, I get that." Like listening to Status Quo or something like that, <laughs> or the Sex Pistols. You just yeah. you hear it and you go, "Yeah, I'm in." And that's kind of what people like, you know, what we were good at, or, or the influence we took from or listening to punk and 
post-punk music. And so did all our sort of contemporaries, I think, like Underworld, The Prodigy. You know, they were all big riff bands that could hold your attention with a mass arena, you know, whereas club music can tend to be quite meditative and, and you know, not, it's not going to hold a massive audience so, so easily, but it'd be fantastic in a club, you know. Uh, that's my that's my reckoning anyway. That's you yeah, know because yeah. I mean that someone told me there are about forty thousand people there, and like they can't have all been Orbital fans. We were barely on on our third <laughs> album at that point. Do you know what I mean? And it was well, yeah, it was it was amazing to see it happen. Snivelization had gone well in my world. That was huge, and that was around. But it hadn't come out then. It was supposed to be out before we played Glastonbury. <sighs> the record company delayed it. Uh-huh. We, being the inexperienced young men that we were, did that classic thing of playing to 40,000 people and presenting them with mostly a new album. Didn't realise you're supposed to play, play your greatest hits at a festival. <laughs> Not that we had many greatest hits at that point. Uh-huh. You know, but we, you know, it was, yeah, we were playing all this kind of, we, we'd only done two gigs. We did, did two warm-up gigs and then we're playing all these sort of complex tracks like Are We Here with all these kind of drum and bass sort of jungle kind of drums. Yeah. And, Oh, it was it was intense for ah. for us and and brilliant fun as well. But it see it seemed to work. Oh God, I mean, it, I mean it it's one of those things of it just being. I, oh, my memories of it are kind of vague for obvious reasons. Uh, it was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> uh, it just every, everyone was so psyched and up, you know, really really up. <laughs> so that's so intoxicating from the audience point of view just just everyone is so excited and then yeah it was just an incredibly exciting oh wow brilliant times and yeah wow and here i am now talking to you all these years later. yeah <laughs> fantastic so yeah i mean it's uh so yeah so talking about the passage of time a little bit um I'm I'm really interested about how your your ear is attuned to textures and um and how you keep that fresh because obviously an analog oscillator will do so much uh, and they are beautiful things. Uh, do you still kind of get off on very simple sort of synthesizer sounds, or are you a little bit have you are you have you bored of that side of things and need to go deeper? It, go, it, it comes and goes, really. I, I go through phases. I mean, I've got a ridiculous collection of analog synths. Um, but I do find I get ear fatigue if I do tracks with just synths, um, especially just analog synths. It can happen, don't get me wrong. And I've done some that I really love with just synths as well. Um, normally, there'll be lots of modulation and very quickly recorded. Um, but my main love, and I've kind of neglected it a little bit, and I'm going back to it at the minute, has always been sampling. That's that's the thing that got me into electronics in a big way. Um, when I saw, it was a school program, and it was either Midyear or yes, could have been Peter Gabriel. Rock school. I think it was Midyear. Was it Rock School? No, no, before Rock School. Oh, before before rock, school. rock School. Okay. This is something that I saw when I was actually at secondary school, watching a, a sort of math, in a maths program or something like oh, that. Oh, cool! And they kind of demonstrated the Fairlight. Um, with a guitar sample and i remember watching it just thinking that's what i want to do i don't know how it's going to work i don't know how i'm going to afford one of these thirty thousand pound <laughs> machines i'm not even sure what you're really going to do with it but that's what i want to do and i i remember you know like hankering after a sampler and buying one of those really cheap sort of 30 quid casio samplers that you know um, from the local music shop when i was a um, sick form college and just loving it and then moving on to delay pedals that could sample yeah. and then getting onto the s700 sampler which just uh. blew me away that 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 my first sampler was just uh, yeah, yeah that i have never been more excited by a piece of equipment than that more more than any analog synth that i've ever bought oh interesting so i mean um have you still got that sampler no it got stolen oh. um but, you know, I have got, um, I did buy recently one of the um, S612s, which is like one voice of that, but with knobs on. So, you know, I'm not complaining. And with nowadays, you know, you don't, I don't need the sort of multi-timbrality of it. Right. So, 
So, yeah. You know, it's yeah. it's all good. It's literally one of those with with knobs on, so that's great. Well, because I was going to ask about that really, just because of the sound of that sampler, uh, the sound of the S seven hundred. Uh, I mean, I used an I was S nine fifty was the first sampler that I really got to use, and the sound of that is fantastic. So I was just curious about what you thought about the is it the converters or what is it in in the sound of those um, samplers? It's, it's really crunchy. It's got a really sort of dry crunchy sound that i i've been listening to a lot of my old um four track recordings oh, cool um so we're talking about cassette um <laughs> my first drum machine was a 909 um wow. got it really got it for 230 quid because nobody wanted them because yeah. it wasn't digital that's right um in the mid 80s <laughs> <laughs> um everyone wanted a 707 back then but um it's i i, I got that the 909 and the s700 and sort of sampling drums on that and pairing them up with the 909, it just sounds like a beautiful kind of match made in heaven. The warmth of a 909 on cassette, the really kind of muddy, woody kind of sound with these really sharp sort of industrial samples of, of drum sounds. It's great. Really good combination, which is what I, I got that thing to, to do some, you know, crunchy sampling on. Mm, great. Nice. The other thing that I loved about the S700 that I discovered is that because I only had one analog synth at the time, which was an SH09, if I wanted to do something with that, but ha also have another sort of sound. Um, and that was also before I had any um, control voltage boxes. So what I would do is I'd sample like a big dow noise from the SH09 and then play it like really fast 16th like an acid bass line and then just dial through the start time uh -huh. so you modulate it by cutting into the sample so it's, it's at the end it's almost just like a little sub and it just grows oh, wow. and that was brilliant and then i discovered doing things like getting little snippets of vocals and putting them at 16th and dialing through the start time and you used to get this most amazing kind of sort of proto granular sort of sampling which you know i've used uh, over the years but only the s700 or maybe the 900 can do it as well but no modern samplers because they don't have that kind of cue dial to to dial through the mic you know the tiniest numbers because you could pick which number you wanted to edit as well so you'd go cool. to really small yeah. and dial through the sample really slowly wow oh that's so interesting so that that's also kind of using it in a way that it probably was never conceived of being used and uh, that's right and a lot of the joy in instruments is finding is is kind of perverting their use i suppose um yeah but you mentioned... well you find that out by accident because you kind of do it because you maybe sample a drum sound or something and, and you've got a bit of a lead in time so it's out of time mm -hmm. you play the sequence and you kind of dial in to find the the bite of the first bit of sound but then you kind of go further and go oh hello that's interesting wow uh, and it's you know it's just, it was just brilliant <laughs> yeah nice and you mentioned the sh09 there and it, and it did actually make me think of someone who i was wondering if you've ever come across but um the band uh the comet is coming have you come across them at all because no uh, the name sounds familiar but i haven't i think they were mercury nominated so they're you know they're they're, they're a london band they're a three-piece band um Shabaka, um, who's uh, who's the else play? He plays with um, Sons of Kemet as well. There's a there's a kind of new sort of jazz thing going on. But um, uh, the reason why I mention it is uh, there's three piece uh, drums, synth, and saxophone. <laughs> Drum synth sax trio. Um, and, I like it already. <laughs> yeah, the keyboard player. <laughs> his, his name is Dan Danalog, and he plays <laughs> he plays mostly just an sh09 through a, oh, a, nice. and a delay pedal and he goes and uh, and he has a, an ampeg svt stack behind him um which is cranked i mean really banging it out um they are something else but his use of that synthesizer is something to behold it really amazing it's very inspiring because it's almost as though he's he's I mean, I think what, he's got a Juno. He has another thing with him that he can do chords on, but the, but all the action really happens on the the SH09. And I was just marvelling about how great it still sounded. I mean, you know, going out through that big valve bass amp as well. Just, um, but he does a lot of solos. Uh, and yeah, I was just marvelling at how they got it so right, Roland. How they managed to make these devices and how they how could they have 
done it? How could they have got it so right? When I don't know. They did, though, didn't they? Because I was a very much a, early on, um, very much a Roland kind of boy. You know, I, I, I don't know why, but around where I lived, it was all second-hand Rolands. SH09s, SH101s, 909s. Everything I had, 303s, you know, everything that, that we had was mostly Roland stuff. Um, we were really surprised when we got an Oscar and thought, oh, God, it sounds completely different. It's, <laughs> it's, you know, we, we just kind of assumed all synths sounded alike, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, but I've, so I kind of grew up with that Roland kind of sound. So I, it, it, if I was to affiliate myself with a brand of analog synths, it would definitely be the Rolands that I know. But they are very kind of sweet spot orientated. Their LFOs don't tend to have that much of a yeah, range and yeah. things like that. And so it does mean you could throw it about anywhere you like and it'll pretty much yeah. always come out good, which makes it a good live machine. You know, they're all like that. The, uh, the, you know, the Jupiter six is one of my long-term long-standing sort of live generals that I take <laughs> live, you know, and it's, it's like, I can just play that thing and know exactly where to go, where it's going to go. And it's, it's great, you know, really good. Uh, that's a really interesting point because I, I typically moan about that, uh, those, those ranges but that's a fantastic different angle on that um yeah yeah i mean i wouldn't mind slightly you know a bit of variation on the lfo speeds but i'm you yeah. know i'm not going to complain because they do they do work really well you know and all of them all of them do you know you've got yeah. things like the persister 100m that's got a much broader range um you know so it's kind of next level roland but it is strangely like a modular sh101 and it's kind of set as soon as I plugged it in, I just went, oh, so what? It's, a, it's the 101. It just sounds like that. And it's got those super snappy envelopes that, mm. that Roland are, are good at. Um, yeah. So it's, you know, I've, I do love other synths as well. I do love, you know, I, I've got a Voyager, which I love plugging in. And that's just a different sound. And, yeah. you know, Oberheim Expander, things like that. Oh, yeah. Beth M5N. But, you know, and you, you tend to, you know, the more you know your synths, you tend to kind of know which one to reach for. Sometimes a Roland will just, that's the only thing they'll do, you know. How, uh, what, what about new things? Have you have you um, tried the Hydrosynth or anything else? In the, no, uh, that's... I wouldn't mind. Mm. I wouldn't mind trying a Hydrosynth. I'm very cautious mm. about buying sort of more equipment, not necessarily <laughs> new, just because I've got more, you know, I've got to that saturation point where mm. I know a lot of my more recent stuff a little bit and i don't know it intimately and i yes. don't like that because i know that you get much more out of um you know what you're doing with synthesis if yeah. you know your equipment intimately Intimate. it's it's definitely better like you were saying like the the guy with the you know playing live with the sh09 he'll know that intimately and yeah. that's just so much better but i have got you know being sort of obsessive with about samplers i've been wondering why no one's made a sort of modern sampler so along came the quantum and so I got one of them, mm. Profit X, I got as well at the same time. And I'm currently making a, a literally before we got on this call, I, I'm editing sounds. Um, I'm up to, I've got over, I think I'm near about a thousand. These are mm. tiny hits though. But um, of, of sounds where I've been going back to sort of where I grew up in Dunton Green and Seven Oaks and Dartford where I was born recording i do field recordings field like playing on the side of the house that i was born at on and you know oh. and phil rattling the the fence of the school he went to oh. and that kind of thing That's and amazing. um and just get you know recording the reverbs in places i used to hang out and drink under do underage drinking and things like that <laughs> and um you know who knew that reverb i know it intimately and it sounds fantastic no um, intimately but you know yeah. and so I have been editing all those sounds and I'm, when I finished doing all of that, you know, it's for a project. It was 30, it's inspired by having 30 years of orbital. I thought I'd go back and do something that's um, sample based and, you know, autobiographical without actually necessarily telling the story. But for me, it's, it's like, it's almost like sort of hauntology kind of music. Yeah. You know what I mean? Making yeah. music from the sounds of your past. It's kind of wow. a bit witchy and a bit creepy. Um, <laughs> Yeah. But I'm going to put them all on an SD card and pump them into the quantum and see, see what it can do. You know, um, it's interesting because it's a different kind of machine to something like an E4 where you, you know, might have, you know, 50 odd samples all rattling away at the same time in multi-timbral mode. 
um, with a different filter on each sample. You know, it's it's not we're we're, we're not in that world anymore. But uh, you know, I am going to get my E4, which I'm tapping right next to me. I'm <laughs> going to get it upgraded to have an SSD so that oh, I can start guess. using that again. Yeah. Um, because I suspect sort of, which is why I wanted a hardware sampler. I suspect having kind of hardware filters and inputs, um, you know, DA, AD converters and all of that just gives things a character. I love the samplers in Ableton, but I don't seem to get the same kind of joy when I use the Ableton sampler to do some velocity to filter or something as I used to with an E4. It's, yeah. So I want to kind of test it out. And, uh, you know, with the big analog filters in the quantum, I want to see what goes on there. And the, and the, the Prophet X has got some brilliant filters in it. The only thing they've done, which is I don't understand their architecture and the way they put the ability to put samples into it is so archaic and <laughs> wrong. It's just <laughs> it's unbelievable. I'm going to oh. go with it, but okay. it's such a crap way of going about things. And I don't understand why they filled it with these uh. kind of ultra sampled kind of stuff that really would be better off using them in contact or something i don't know because it's only eight notes so if you want to play big pianos you don't want eight notes do you that's what i see people complaining about on gear slots anyway it doesn't matter to me yeah. why the hell do i want a profit x for a piano sound yeah. it's, it's beyond me i don't it's not what it's for it's i want to use it as a crazy synth and and sample engine so i'm going to go through the pain of setting up all the samples in in that world and this weird system of putting them in, and hopefully then I will have an instrument for life that I won't ever have to bother with the sampling process <laughs> again. You know. Yeah, I guess as well, though. I mean, and and I'm sure you can relate to this, having dealt with gear for so so long. That the weird quirks and sort of foibles of bits of kit does mean that as much as that might be a tedious thing, you might start finding ways of doing it or discover something in the process or, in fact, find a way of breaking it and finding something in it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to be optimistic. That <laughs> yeah, well, look, look it's once you've done the process, I think the yeah. thing is you've got to be quite zen about it and think, you know, in the olden days, you get your record player on top of your sampler and you just start throwing stuff at it and editing it and throwing stuff at it and, you're using two hands and it's all, you know, everything's going off at the same time. With this, you've got to be a little bit more chess about it and plan things and think, OK, I've got to get all my samples ready. I've got to get them in a particular, you know, they've all got to be 16 bit, 48 kilohertz. That's a pain in the ass for a start. Yeah. And then I'm going to put them into the software and prepare it all. Then I'm going to hope that when I put them into the machine, it doesn't overwrite all the sounds that I've already put in there and, and made. Yes. And hopefully all will be right with the world. You know, <laughs> I, I've been assured that that is what will happen. Mm. Um, so I'm going to go with it and try it. But then once it's in there, you will treat it in a different way because it yes. will become your very own kind of rompler. Yeah. It's yes. not gonna, you're never going to start putting stuff in on a day because the, yeah. the process of sampling, yeah. putting it in their software, putting it on a key, putting it there, it's just a buzzkill uh, completely. But, right. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> At the same time, having a thousand new samples in it, yeah, that and then exploring it yeah. is not a buzzkill. That's no. a total, you know. And in fact, mm. you don't start thinking, oh, but what if I sampled this? It's like no, you won't think that. You'll just think I'm going to use this the sounds is... I've already put in it. So in a way, yeah. like you say, once you've done that process, yeah, it might be fantastic. And it's got some brilliant filters. Um, you know, I I think there's a, a yeah. I really like the sound of it, the, the actual inherent sound of the thing. So I'm definitely going to go with it. I just don't like the like its sampling process. But you know, yeah. yeah. What can we say? <laughs> you know, no, nobody's perfect. Have you ever Have you ever tried out any electron devices? Is that something you're interested in? Yeah, yeah. I've got I've near. I think I've got all of them apart from the apart from the sampling one actually, which <laughs> I didn't like the look of. The I love the the crossfade thing. You have to try. That was brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it, I'm really mostly interested in polyphonic keyboard sampling. I don't really like the MPC drum machine stuff because as soon as I get a good sample, the first thing I want to do is pitch it up and down the keyboard. And I just don't like yeah. not being able to do that. Although, having said that, I have, I'm, I'm looking at my um, analog rhythm Mark II. 
Yes. Which I thought was, is really good. Yes. Um, and I'm learning that. I'm trying to, since lockdown, I came home with just one, no, two drum machines. I've still got the 909 <laughs> tucked away over there yeah, as well. Yeah. But um, I'm desperately sort of trying to focus on that, to learn that. And I'm yeah. learning, you know, it's the little things that you only learn when you really nice. dig into something. And that's, yeah. I thought all its high hats were, were really bad and really crap. And I just couldn't work it out. And then I started putting little bits of overdrive and distortion on them. And it's like, ah, oh, there they are. Hello. Right. And then they all come to life. And it's like, right, I've, I had to learn that lesson for myself, you know. Yeah, I, I've got one right here. Uh, and I, I would, I'm going to make a video about it, positing that this is a contender for the best drum machine of all time, which is a very, uh, very, con <laughs> you know, a very sort of, ooh, it's, it's got some, you know, people will argue until they're blue in the face on this one um one thing i have been doing with it lately is with the last firmware update that came out i think what was about a year ago uh being able to do uh randomize any of the pages have, have you played around with that function on there no oh i tell you no, what, what's that what, what happens oh it's it's amazing it so you can uh, any of the so the way electron boxes work sorry this is just for people who like before they just fall off the edge here um it's very much about uh, you've got a, a set of parameter controls and then you have to choose which page that you're on and those parameters. So there'll be the envelopes, there'll be the um, LFO controls, blah, blah, blah. Uh, now, when you select one of those pages, so let's say we selected the filter page. Um, there's a, uh, What's the key combo now? Uh, oh, I can't remember the key combo. But you, you do that. Oh. And it will create, I know, sorry, a tease, and then, uh, but it, it'll it'll randomise all the parameters on that on, okay. on that particular page. So so sometimes when you get randomization functions, it'll be kind of global across all the parameters. Yeah, yeah. But because this is only for, <clears throat> so you can like randomise the LFO page, and you can just keep flicking through it. And what's actually really nice is if if you decide you've got one chance to go back, so there's like um, if you press. It's like function and no or something. It'll jump back to the pre the last sort yeah. of random one. So because you can end up going through it fast, just triggering a sound. Just no, 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 no. Oh, actually, the last one. Then you can go back just one. Uh, so you can go through, and then you just you can just flick through the different pages, random, 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 hit, hit, and it's it it. It's put an element into that drum machine that I don't think was there before, which is uh, okay. this incredibly fast, spontaneous thing. Because it is, otherwise, as with all Electron devices, and this is the criticism and the benefit all in one, is that this cerebral devices that you have to kind of know, as opposed to just reach out and tweak. You do need to know what's going on in the back. Oh, yeah. You need to have it all in your mind. And they... And they do require quite a lot of concentration to get the best out of them. But yeah, they've definitely got easier as they've gone along. Um, I think the the Digitact and the Digitone are, yeah. are easier again. They, that's yeah. I, I kind of wish that the analog rhythm had more of that in its um, sort of structure. Do you know yeah. what I mean? The way you know, the, the, I'm always terrified of losing the kit. <laughs> you do come up with something great, and you flip to another pattern, go back, and you go, "Oh no, I've lost my kit because yeah. you've." You, you did you've got to save kits every you know yeah. every step of the way and that's a little terrifying yeah because it's kits then there's sounds and there's um also patterns and if you say if you change yeah. pattern and not kit uh it, there's there's the, all these things you really need to be very mindful of with yeah. the electron stuff however but when, they've got rid of that on the new ones haven't they yeah they've they've kind of lifted it up a layer although some more features are coming back in the new updates for the digitone and the digitact uh right. also put uh, um like conditional trigs and um variable step lengths and a whole load of yeah a whole load of cool the stuff. conditional trigs are great though aren't they that's a really yes. interesting thing to put you know, I, I I kind of dismissed that when I first heard it. I thought, why would you want to do that? And then I've started making patterns with all these ghost notes and putting them at, you know, a little you know, maybe, you know, a lot of maybe on there. And it just, it's uh -huh. really interesting what comes out. Yeah. So then, and then it's just the fact that it sort of is constantly kind of inspiring you by being, ooh, that's oh, nice. Just always bits. 
Because with those kind of conditional trigs, there's some quite clever things, apart from like maybe choosing percentage likelihood of, of that trig playing. Yeah. You can also set that um, if the neighbour plays, then it doesn't play. And then so, oh. so you, can yeah, start yeah. Getting, you can start getting really complicated. So, yeah. Um, but again, I mean, uh, just to finish off about Electron, I think that uh, they have taken a very particular kind of route um they have it, it, i've noticed their ins their inspiration is really starting to show in lots of other things now the terms conditional trigs or or, or even actually um parameter locking which was entirely something from the uh in, only the electron uh devices you start no no not true not, not true. true the original parameter locking drum machine was the drum tracks oh educate me because um, you could do that you that was unbelievable i couldn't believe it when i i had one I, again it got kind of disappeared out of my studio i lent it to someone and oh. never saw it again oh, no. and um but it you could do you could do a basic version of, of um parameter locks with pitch on that but it kind of you could only do it to one sound or it affected all of the sounds or something but it was pretty groovy and then the best one for it the one that really blew me away and i think it's the sound of early warp records and, and orbital records and that's the r8 the r8 you could do parameter locks and it was absolutely phenomenal what what you can do on an r8 How still one of my favorite drum machines and the act in fact i've put all the kicks and snares in my um analog rhythm um i know you're supposed to call it written but i can't i just don't <laughs> like that um but um yeah, I, I've, I've put and it's got an interesting thing. It makes them sound better. I don't know why. The, the, whatever mm. it's doing sample wise, it makes them really crunchy and, and nice. It makes them really satisfying. So that's good to know that the sample engine in that thing is also quite special. Mm. Oh, I think it's yes. I'm, uh, if it is a very deep, but they can be intimidating if you haven't spent. If you if you take a bit of time away from them and then come back to them and you're you, a little bit like. Whew, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I had an idea once. It, it, well, actually, the idea occurred during a Sonic talk. But I was thinking how, how cool it would be to get a little box that could be that could play back samples. So very, very sample rompler, I guess, with a big knob on the top. And when you change the knob, it changes uh, which digital to analog converters it uses. And you load it with, and that's all it sort of does. So you can call up any sample, play any sample, and then just choose which output converter. Really, what do you think about that? <laughs> I think I think that would be quite subtle. Yeah. Um, yeah. Certainly to my ears, I, I think. Although it's one of those things that is quite important. You know, if I think about Akai samplers, it's a very different impression I get to Emu samplers. They're very, very different. Yeah. But. And I spot that in a record. I don't know. I can certainly mm. spot it myself when I'm using these things. Um, I, I kind of instinctively think, oh, no, I need to do you know, that on an emu. I need to do that on an akai. You know, drums on an akai, melody and harmony on an emu. That's kind of... Although, you know, drums on an emu have a kind of gluey, gloopy kind of quality. It's really interesting. It does have a, have a weird effect, mm. you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Hey, so, so, like, I'm... Um... Because I'm always uh, I'm always thinking about like ideas about kit and what is kind of important, what isn't important. Um, and this is something I wanted to ask you about, really. Um, when you play an instrument, uh, and actually, well, you did mention this with Roland uh, with the Jupiter Six earlier, knowing that you can throw the controls around with a, a, a certain amount of confidence. Um, yeah. What do you what do you typically f sort of really rate or favour in terms of the the UI the the, the way that you interact with it? Um, for in, I mean, for instance, are you uh, envelopes have to be on um, sliders kind of guy? Um, you know? Not really. Although no. I do I do like that mm -hmm. um, coming from a sort of Roland ARP sort of world. Um, I mean, that's kind of what drew me to the Macbeth M five um, was you know it had that kind of ARP look it doesn't sound like an art it, you know it's got elements of loads of old greats you know but it's its own thing you know the the, the macbeth sound as it's the macbeth sound and that is you know so i'm, I'm looking over here because i'm looking at it <laughs> but um it's i do like i do like faders and i took that live and that's when i really learned to to use it i knew it before i took it live and i knew i wanted to take it live but by the, the end of a year's touring i knew it inside out 
And that's got that goes beyond sweet spots. So you have to be careful with that one. Right. So, um, so I suppose so, um, my question then, I guess, uh, well, we could actually look at it in two in two ways, really. Uh, what works in the studio and what, and what works live. Um, it's so utterly different environments. Uh, but I mean, when you when you say assess a new piece of equipment, like let's say when you got your hands on the Quantum for the first time. Um, yeah. Are you really appreciating its kind of build quality and how sort of wiggle how how the knobs don't vibe, you know don't wiggle from left to right or you know that or yeah I guess I'm oh, sorry go on carry on what, 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 what were you going to say <laughs> it's a bit of an abstract question I was trying to formulate a question out of this but just in terms of oh, okay. the things that really kind of kind of give you that sort of satisfying like you know I like this I want to use this. I could feel comfortable using this live. Uh, what are the kind of qualities that you look out for it, that, for those? Okay, kind of I think really, I think an intuitive interface. You know, something that you can go to, go to and, and work out straight away. You know, um, looking around me, the, the quantum's got a very nice feel. Um, you know, and that's also something that I was been waiting for someone to do. Is a you know a virtually? I know you'll never get fully knob for function, but a virtually knob per function sampler it's brilliant you know big filter dials um envelope dials on a on a sampler it's great yeah um so that's you know and then you've got control of all the sort of granular engine on knobs as well so you know that's amazing um and that feels pretty good i don't really think about the build quality i i really you know i'm a terrible sort of gear slut and i i often find myself laughing at people complaining about the build quality of stuff that i haven't even noticed is, right. is what they consider bad i don't care my, yeah. there's only one thing i bought that i just couldn't believe how shoddy it was and i think that was an mfb synth um and you know the, so you turned the filter knob and it went beyond the <laughs> it just would keep going <laughs> round. all yeah. the knobs you had to be really careful of you know it was so so cheap mm. and tiny so i you know i get it but I, I wanted that to be sort of tougher, but mm. you know, for me, things like a very intuitive synth would be um, the Base Station Two, oh. which is something I love. I love that. <laughs> and I, when I first got one, um, Novation brought one around and said, "Here, try this." And I just thought, oh, "Another mono synth." And actually, it really grabbed me because it's got all the modern features that that so something like an SH09 doesn't have, um, all the sort of velocity stuff. And you know, it's just, it's got two two oscillators but it's got quite a lot of control going on it's a little bit not quite knob per function a little bit select oscillator one two one two you know but once you're down with it you kind of instinctively do that without really thinking about it so it's mm. that that you know for the size of it um and you see that's a really light lightweight plastic synth i don't i don't think oh no i wish the you know i wish it had metal end cheeks and all of the, you know it's i don't care right, right. it's robust and it works live mm. it, you know it's a really good good piece of kit for that yeah and um you know that's 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 good with sweet spots but it does go beyond a, an old roland it's lfos are much faster and things like that so i you know that i do rate the interface on that i never had any trouble with that that's a good balance hmm. um uh, but you know i mean knobs 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 you know that's <laughs> that's the key I've, key for me I've got, i don't care whether they're fake <laughs> <laughs> i've got an interested knob question for you now <laughs> um which control now this is this is a this is a one for you now which control that's largely like underused uh, uh, is, is do you have like a particular favorite sort of control for instance I, i've been really enjoying using the filter tracking control f uh, is a, as a creative control and i've only recently sort of sort of discovered how you can use that in ah. a creative way uh is, do you have any sort of controls that are, like the lowly controls that you that you've got a little f fondness for? Well, I guess we we'll go back to what we were talking about earlier, and that's um, on a on an old Akai sampler, sort of velocity to start time. That uh, sorry, not velocity. That's also a trick that I love. But you know, just just dialing in on the start time of a sample because it goes beyond the you know when you do velocity to start time, you've got 128 options. When you do it with the actual editing wheel, it's, yeah. you know, oh. tiny. Yeah. Um, so that's, that was always, mm. that was always a big thing for me. Um, 
accessing random kind of elements on a on an Emacs two, you know, sort of again, that was a good throw fader. So you'd you'd hit hit kind of um, sample start, give it a fast sequence, and just kind of hack through the sample <laughs> up and down, up and down, yeah. and get all sorts of craziness. Uh, that's, um, that is but cool. I'm just looking around to see if there's something that I know because I know what you mean. Mm. You do sometimes get into things, don't you? But I don't yeah. think. Uh, actually, I'll tell you what it is with me, what I've found with things like the Base Station 2, especially, and the Macbeth. No, sorry, not the Macbeth. The Base Station 2 and the uh, Matrix Brute is playing with the mixer volume knobs because they are wildly different. Depend If you've got mm. a two oscillator sound with, uh, say, two octaves apart, and you put them both halfway, you can hear them both. If you turn one of them up to the top, it drowns out the other one, but in a really harmonically rich kind of way. So actually, one of the forms of modulation I do um, live when I'm doing a really gnarly bit of kind of acid housing kind of thing is with the Matrix Brute. And I'm, I've got two oscillators, and I'm just turning them up and down. And um, when you glide them in and out of each other, you would think that would just sound like two sounds coming and going, but it doesn't. They bite they bite and claw at each other like sort of Godzilla and Mothra or something. You know, it's kind of, it's just amazing what happens. And they kind of growl and, and you know, it's like turning all oscillators up and sub on a base station two is not the same as hearing them all equally. It's, it's a, wow. that, so I think, I think mm. mixer volume is a really, really like fun thing to play with. Brilliant answer. Thank you. I mean, I was, I was scrabbling around trying to make the question. I must get my big marker pen out though to highlight that last, uh, that last paragraph as well. Um, yeah. So I, I, one I was thinking about actually is LFO delay on like you typically have on Roland's and then just having, you know, really extreme or by Roland standards, extreme LFO settings and, and just sort of swinging on the delay control. Uh, that's nice. Yeah. You yeah. get, that's a great thing for live as well. You get that kind of proper eighties, Paul Hardcastle kind of jazz funk kind of <laughs> at the end of something, which is yeah. great. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, Great. OK, well, uh, oh, I'm just going to wonder about time now, because one thing we've noticed with, with the show is um, actually I prob I'm, I'll do this as an edit point. Um, if the show's long, how, the longer they are, less people seem less inclined to kind of click, click on to it. I think they sometimes probably That's think, weird. yeah, yeah, I think they might be thinking, oh, gosh, if it's podcast, it doesn't really matter. But on like YouTube videos. People seem to kind of go. Oh no, I can't. I can't commit that much time to watching a video. Yeah, I think that's it, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I was just kind of cutting in there because I think we've probably actually whilst I'm doing this as well, let me just press that button. There we go. <laughs> um, so I tell you what, we'll do then. I think uh, if we sort of we'll just do we'll just have like say like a last topic and to sort of bring it into sort of uh, to like some sort of conclusion. Well, not conclusion, but okay, yeah. yeah. God, so many, so much. There's so much good stuff in this, though. I, I'm going to probably keep most of it uh, in. I'm going to only edit out those little this bit and the little bit, and most of it's just going to be uh, just free form. And I am waffling terribly at times. I might cut back with some of my nonsense. <laughs> um, okay, uh, right. So we talked about here. Um, like, uh, okay. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to black out. It's going to black out and then it'll come back in. It's easy for me to find the edit. I should have done that one before. <laughs> okay. Um, just again, it's funny because in, in a rhythm and then come out of the rhythm. It's like, ooh. Um, okay, let's talk. We'll talk about future plans and um, obviously and a little bit about lockdown y sort of stuff. Um, we'll talk about a little about lockdown leading into future plans and uh, saying, you know, it's difficult to know about when to return to live and stuff along those kind of lines. And then I, I can see how we've got a little get out there to get to get to the end. <laughs> OK. OK. Uh, Go for it. <laughs> right. So lockdown, I mean, something all of us can relate to. Uh, how has it been for you? It's been all right, actually. I've kind of set up a studio at home before the week before lockdown happened, I knew it was going to happen. And I just um, went to the studio with my big kind of um, dad mobile um, estate car, chucked all my desert island synths in the back of it <laughs> and came home and set up a studio. Um, and and that's where I've been. And actually, it's been really good. I've been sort of 
you know, working with less equipment, uh, my favorite speakers, and just trying to sort of keep down on the plugins as well and just mm. trying to use, you know, one or two compressors and one EQ and things like that. And it's been really nice. And I've learned a lot more about mixing and engineering. Um, I set up the is it Sonarworks thing where you, where you do the crazy thing with the microphone and you scan your room and it ah, tunes your, your sort of system. Mm -hmm. It's been a revelation. It's oh. absolutely brilliant. So much cheaper than all the acoustic stuff that I should have done. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's, it's actually really, it's worked really good. I recommend okay. it for anyone who wants to sort of be sure about the sound that they've got. I mean, you know, it's a couple of hundred quid, but it was worth, well worth spending for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've been, yeah, I've, I, and I've I've just been. It's funny because when it first happened, I've I almost felt a bit creatively sick, if for want of a better word, and found that all the kind of more beatsy, aggressive stuff, it just seemed inappropriate. It didn't seem like the right music to make when everyone yeah. was feeling very tender and kind of scared in this kind of weird soft apocalypse that we found ourselves <laughs> in. You know, it's Fuck kind it. of. It was, you know, because that's the funny thing that we've discovered. It's like in films. When the apocalypse hits, everybody's looting and killing each other. This apocalypse, we can't even hug or touch each other. And everyone's been really kind and looking after each other and making sort of streetwide sort of WhatsApp groups. And are you OK? Mm. Do we need any shopping? And it's, you know, it's just pretty good. And good point. for me, it made me want to make only kind of kind of, hug, you know, group hug Fluffy. kind of soft <laughs> music. Tracks like Halcyon and Belfast came to mind. So I've been kind of going down that kind of slightly melancholy, warm, really sitting around the fire, still dancing, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but that, that kind of soft kind of music. And I find I'm coming out of that a bit now. And all those kind of tough old sort of aggressive tracks might start to sort of come out. But I've just been writing and writing and writing. And um, I've also done an album's worth of stuff with a friend of mine. We did it by accident. Um, a friend of mine, Murray Lachlan Young, the poet, he does a thing on Radio 6 where he does a poem every yeah, Friday. Yeah. And I, we got in touch just at the beginning of the lockdown. Just, you know, he said, oh, here's my new album. And I said, oh, we really should do something. And I said, what about a kind of virus diary kind of thing? And he said, well, that's what I'm doing, Radio 6. Oh. And I said, well, he said, do you want to do the, the, you know, do you want to score it? And I'll do the, the words. So every week he sends me a poem on Wednesday. I do the music on Thursday and it gets broadcast on Friday. And it's just Amazing. been a kind of weekly diary of... Um, you know what's been going on and, you know it's um and, and, yeah it's, it's it's been great we've we've got about an album's worth of stuff now and we'll, we'll see the light of day then will that get a release oh yeah for sure that's mm. we're, we're gonna have a planning a sort of you know planning meeting on friday about it oh, we've put a single out as well we've we've, we've put a single out um with all the proceeds going to NHS ah, charities together, I will, called um, I'm I, Going Shopping. <laughs> I've got links in underneath here, so make sure you all click on that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, difficult to know about um, when return to live will happen properly. Um, have you done any uh, broadcasts, any any live shows, uh, sort of streaming shows at all? Or is that something you make? Um, yeah, I did one for Hacienda that came that came to me and asked me to do it, and they but. Um, sort of trying to raise money for all the sort of nighttime jobs that have disappeared from the sort of whole clubbing Gosh, and dance yeah. music scene in Manchester, you know. Mm. Um, so I just, I just sort of got down the studio, set the, the orbital rig up and just kind of attacked it for an hour, which was great fun, actually, yeah. during the right at the beginning of the lockdown. That was quite a nice release. Wow. Um, so one final question, and this is something I'm always curious about uh, dance music producers. Do you dance? No, I'm one of those. <laughs> I used to. <laughs> no, actually, that's not true because I just spent two years being a Morris dancer, what? Um, and that's not that's not a, that's not a joke. Um, <laughs> but um, so I do dance. Actually, it's not true at all. Um, right. I don't tend to dance at weddings. I tend to chat. But um, no, mo I don't. I don't, don't go out clubbing or anything like that. I, but what I do do, I'm that kind of weird middle aged man at the back of the hall at every <laughs> festival I go to sort of standing at the back of the techno tent with a very serious face. <laughs> all the other serious face, middle-aged men, actually. Yeah. Um, just like listening and taking it all in. And, and you know, I, I kind of get to experience, um, you know, the, the whole kind of live electronic or DJ world. When I go out and play and perform, I'm always sort of in and amongst the crowd, checking it out. 
Yeah. Um, but dancing, I tend not to dance. I tend to sort of stand and listen. <laughs> Oh, cool. Uh, well, I think on that note, though, I think I will draw this wonderful chat to an end for, well, I mean, and hopefully in the, maybe in the future we can um, get you back on the show. I mean, I'm hoping to keep this yeah, show yeah. going. Um, thank you so much for, I mean, gosh, there was revelation after revelation there. I think the Morris dancing one is probably the one that tops them all. But <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, has there ever been like a Morris dancing techno kind of crossover? I can see. How... Um, I think um, I think Fortet did a sort of cut up scratch kind of Morris video um, to one of his tracks, but I don't think there was any Morris elements in the track. Right. You know, so that's that... still yet to happen. But you know, yeah. I might tap up the Brighton Morris men for yes. that. I did use them on the on the track um, on the last track that we did with Brian Cox on the uh, Monsters Exist album. There's a bit where there's there's some chanting in it. And I, when we were doing, you know, the sort of break in the middle of the sort of practice session, I got them all chanting <laughs> and bought them a barrel of Harvey's ale to, to um, you know, yeah. for, the, for the pleasure. Yeah. yeah, you've got to pay Morris men in, in ale, haven't you? I mean, it's, it, it, it's very, very important. <laughs> right. Paul, thank you ever so much. And uh, yes, uh, what a pleasure. And um, well, best, best of luck with, with your future endeavours. And, and let's get you back in the future, if, if that's cool. Absolutely. Lovely. Thank you. Cheers. Bye bye, everybody. We can wave. We can... Bye. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.